Big business, markets, local trends. This is the Chapman Report from Chapman University. And welcome back to the Chapman Report. It's our bi-weekly look at business, the financial markets, and a special focus on the regional economies of Southern California. I'm Pete Weitzner. I head up the broadcast journalism program here at Chapman University, a couple of blocks east over at Dodge College, Marionette Studios. We're coming to you from just outside the being remodeled here, Argeris Forum, named for George Argeris, former uh, ambassador to Spain. And alongside me, as always, is the good doctor, S.E. Adibi, longtime Chapman economist. He and Jim Doty just wrapped up putting out their 33rd annual economic forecast. Also duck in our student feature stories, Jonathan Formica sat down with the sheriff, Sandra Hutchins. Just won re-election, or first election. Talked about all myriad of, of issues in public safety. First of a two-part series uh, with the sheriff, uh, John Formica and Sandra Hutchins. And also the hottest restaurant right off the griddle. It's right here in Old Town Orange. It's called Bruxy. Alex Ivany takes a look. Who said you can't make a better waffle? Well, let's see if we're making a better economy first, uh, Essie. And we always start with jobs. And one thing I want to say before ask you, before we look at the latest jobs numbers, because they've been pretty constant the last six, nine months. We're creating jobs, not many, not enough to push down the unemployment rate. However, there's been some analysis of late that says actually on the job front, while we know this recovery is tepid compared to the 2001 recovery, we've actually started to create jobs quicker than that one did. Yes. I assume that's true. That is true. It doesn't yeah. seem to make sense because that was a strong recovery. Uh, 2001? Yes. Uh, no, in terms of job, job recovery. But in terms of was, growth? In terms of growth was much, much stronger. So much stronger. But, uh, you know, remember what has happened during this recession. Uh, CEOs got really nervous. They got panicked. So they started laying off in massive numbers. So as soon as the economy started improving, some of them realized, hey, they went overboard. Right. So they're hiring. So when you look at the last year job performance, you're right. It seems extremely weak to everybody's eyes, partly because the unemployment rate mm -hmm. doesn't go down. Right. But in terms of what we have produced, it was it was decent. Over one million jobs we created. Mm -hmm. Part of it, of course, the government numbers distorted it because of the census at the beginning of the year, and then we lost them. But overall, that's a decent number of jobs that we generated during the first year of recovery. But unemployment rate, you know, we're coming from a high number. Unemployment rate was close that's to it, 10%. Right. And it's not dropping. It dropped to 9.4%, but nobody's happy with We're that. at the 20th month, and this is a record, all-time record, the 20th month of above 9% unemployment, and I think we're going to break that record. All right, let's look at the numbers. Now, the rate actually did drop. You always say don't focus on the rate. The rate dropped to 9.4%. 9.4 really yeah. to 9.8, but we only created 103,000 jobs. Yeah, so that shows that that drop wasn't really true drop in terms of people who five. dropped out of their job search. Uh, some All of them, these folks who are six months plus. Some of them are discouraged workers who are leaving, and as a result, unemployment goes down. And part of it, again, was seasonality. You know, remember, we're talking about December numbers. So you get lots and lots of temporary jobs generated for holiday season. So unemployment goes down, but unfortunately, once we get the January number, right. You might see again increasing unemployment. And actually, in a lot spite of, of retail job creation. Jobs, yeah. as you know, were in October. We had a, a two hundred thousand dollar total jump, and almost half were in retail. This time around, most of the jobs, the biggest, were in healthcare. Yes, that's part of it. But again, I don't trust you know the categories of job because you know retailers they did they typically hire in October, but this Christmas season came out very strong. So I'm not surprised if I see some numbers, you know, revision that shows retail numbers actually improved sure. in November and December. People who realize, hey, I need a few more workers because consumers are coming in. So overall, by the way, Pete, one thing again, our, our viewers should know, these numbers go through huge revisions. So I would not be surprised that once the revision is done for December, which came in about 103,000 right. jobs, I wouldn't be surprised if it hits 150, 160, 180. And for the, all of last year, I think the revision is going to be upward than downward. Right. Part of the reason, as you know, these numbers that we get, these are all sampling. That is, uh, government goes to some business establishment and sample them and ask them, are you hiring more or less? Sometimes they forget that there are small businesses <laughs> that are generating one job or two here and there, and they're not represented fully in that sample. 
construction and local government, we still lost jobs. Those yes, seem yes. to be the two still weakest still. sectors. And, we'll and that's, this is be. national, but yeah. this is everywhere, really. This is everywhere. Construction sector, you know, we're seeing some uptick in construction activity. We'll get to that a little bit, a little bit of permitting uh, yeah, activity. Exactly, was but, but again, we're losing our non-residential side. Right. So net effect, not much of a hiring. And local and state government, I mean, California is a good example of it. We can't afford to hire more people. In Trenton, New Jersey, they laid off, Camden, they laid, laid off a third yeah, of 32, firefighters. 32 employees. different states, you know, they, they have huge budgetary problem. And when a state has budgetary problem, basically is indicating that local, you know, see the municipalities they have the same problem so you're not going to get any oomph out of the government sector hiring to help us you know generating job some people say of course that's good news that private sector job are right. more important than government sector but either way i think we'd all like to get back to say six percent unemployment which your friend mr bernanke says <laughs> will be in 2014 and the figures seem to bear him out in that we lost eight million jobs 2007 and 2009 we gained a million plus like you said 2010 and we're going to gain this year, our forecast is about 1.7, 1.8 okay. million jobs. But again, even if you add those two, you're close to 3 million compared million to, what to go. 5 million to go. So unemployment rate is going to be very sticky down. So you agree with his assessment, if not his methods, he's going to continue. We'll talk about this on our next show with his quantitative easing. Yeah, that's the part that I'm hesitant how much good is, is but, we're getting out of it. But here's some of the pot, because you mentioned we may create close to 2 sure. million jobs uh, in 2011. The payroll tax cut's going to help, right? Of Both course. starting in January, of course. we'll get it's a, th a third reduction in the FICA tax from their paycheck. Uh, so that's 2%, 2% yeah. on 50000 $1,000 a year. $1,000, you know, I mean, look at the fiscal stimulus that we have. We still have some of the residual of the big package, $787 billion Obama stimulus package. We have over $100 billion or more of that left. Actually, that's a good spending which is left. That's infrastructure. You, you remember when they passed the stimulus, they said, oh, we have so many shovel-ready projects right. to go. There weren't that many of them. <laughs> so we're going to get some of that. And that's really good, good because it has huge multiplier. And then on top of that, uh, the president agreed to extend, you know, Mr. Bush's tax cuts, which has depreciation, accelerated uh, depreciation, and dividend, you know, going, staying at 15 percent. So all of that, uh, they're helpful. I mean, they're not going to get us much of a boost because we had those right. last year too. But what you mentioned is is the most important thing: the two percent reduction in Social Security taxes, which is going to go to every worker. It's going to bring about our our estimate 80 billion dollars of spending. So that's a very good news. Yeah, and consumers showed this past holiday uh, that they're spending. They're spending, yeah. More than they have in the prior few years, not like in the glory days. But oh, the glory days, of course, they were borrowing and spending. Right. Now what they're trying to do, they're more cautious. They're just working on their existing income and increasing the spending. And actually, that's positive because they're not building up debt. And it, but. But the bad news for the economy is when you come out of recession, consumers come out at five, six, seven percentage point increase in spending. We're getting only three, three and a half percent. But it's better than some of uh, forecasters were suggesting this is going to be a negative number. So partly because of consumer spending with the help of extension of taxes, reduction in Social Security taxes, we think GDP is going to do Exports fine. Exports are booming. Exports are, are doing good. And we are not worried about the Eurozone problem because some people said, oh, those countries are going to you know, really damage our export. They're not our major trading partners. Right. So here in California, California exactly. and it's even Canada, nationwide, it's, Mexico, yeah. it's, it's some of the Asian China, countries. It's Japan, you right. know, Taiwan. Those are important countries. So to all us. the positives for 2011. Real quick, let's look at Orange County and some of the other Southern California counties by comparison. We're right there with the nation. Our rate actually popped up a little to 9.3 in November. California, second highest in the country. Yeah, Los Angeles, problem. even higher than that at 13%. Do we have a problem? Uh, let's, let's just see why Orange County is doing relatively better. And San Diego uh, is as well. And San Diego is doing better. And, and even up north, when you go to Bay sure. Area, they're doing better. Uh, part of the reason Orange economy County fourth best in the, in the state exactly it's more home, more diversified economies you know it's not just construction we have professional business services we have healthcare we have private education we have even you know when you look at the retail and resale uh, wholesale and transportation we have good chunk of those jobs that are growing when you look at california the burden is coming from the areas that are not really diversified economies Central California, 
driven all by construction, and that's absent. There's not much out there. And when you look at the Inland Empire, the drag over there also right. is a construction because that was the only thing which was driving that economy, and there's not much of that job some, coming sure, in. Sure, some of these agricultural communities in Central County or, say, down in the Imperial Valley, they're in the 20s, unemployment. Yeah. I mean, yeah, really because, difficult. Because they were benefiting from construction sector, and that, that is out, and there's nothing else to give them that oomph or lift. So it's going to take them a long time to recover. Jobs aside, uh, the economy, as we mentioned, showing signs of strength. Retail sales in December, sixth straight month of growth. CPI was up five tenths of one percent. Mm, so inflation. That's thanks to Mr. Bernanke. <laughs> well, okay, yeah, and no. thanks to higher. I know. I, I think I included gas prices in here <laughs> I, because we feel you should gas and food. So we're seeing signs of inflation. Huh? Yes, I believe so. You know, uh, the central bankers, uh, Mr. Bernanke and some of his colleagues, are worried about deflation. I don't see deflation happening. I mean, sure, prices. CPI went down uh, early last year and in 2009, mostly because of uh, housing costs. Right. You know, when home prices went down, lease, lease rates went down, what it did, that's 30% of CPI. So CPI turned negative and they started all screaming, oh, deflation, deflation. But now that we're getting home prices stabilization, rents actually are spiking up. CPI is running about 2%. And when you add, as you said, food and energy, you're getting a, that's a big number, you know, increase in CPI. And whether they're going to continue printing money, as, as they call it, quantitative easing or not, I mean, he to me, it's not justified. Yeah, yeah. People were hoping when he said that they're, that he's actually encouraged by what he sees in the economy that he might not. Okay, let's turn to residential real estate, which has really taken a turn south after a pretty good, say, 18 months from the bottom, yes. helped by those incentives, yes. first-time buyers, state yes. and federal, but they expired. Uh, in Orange County back in this time last year, it was only taking three months uh, for homes under a million to sell, that, it's yeah, not bad. Yeah. Uh, now we're back up to five months. Yeah. Uh, ex expensive homes taking over a year to sell. Yeah. Uh, and a number of various, we have a delinquency rate now of 6%. Uh, we know what the unemployment is in the state. Um, so we've given back half of the gains we had from the bottom. So what is plaguing home sales See, right there now? Are, there are countervailing forces at work here when it comes to housing markets. Sure, prices have gone down, mortgage rates are attractive, jobs are being created, all of that helps first time home buyers. So on the low end of the market, you mentioned you know six months of inventory, that's not really a huge number. But then the problem is when you go on the high end of the market, uh, move above the median, Let, let's take median in Southern California at 450,000. You go to 600, 700, one million dollar home, uh, who's gonna buy that? That's a move up market. That means I have to sell my home. Be, first, I have to have equity in my home. Then I should be able to sell it and then go and buy something more expensive and be able to finance it. And all of that are not really favorable for move up market to move to those expensive homes. And the sales of expensive homes have basically is dragging down overall sales activity. Even when you look at the incentives uh, that federal government and the state put in place, most of it was helping first time home buyers and the amount was such that it was like $10,000, which was really making a difference when you're buying a home for 300 or 400,000. So we got a little boost in sales, we borrowed from future. Now the sales have dropped, obviously, from early 2010. Sure. And I think what we're, what's gonna happen, we're gonna be down here for a while, Till the job market comes back. So 410 at the median for, for all, for condos, uh, for resale and new. We're Probably we're going to we're going to be about two, three percentage point. We, we think it would be three percentage point above it. But again, I want to emphasize as long as the job market is weak and for California is weak and for central, you know, part of the state and Inland Empire, you're not going to get meaningful re recovery at the, in the housing market. The best you can hope for, for prices to stabilize, of course that's going to happen in the low end of the market, and for job market to pick up some esteem and bring about some of the potential buyers to absorb the inventory. And another headwind that we have here is foreclosures. We're still going to have some people who borrowed money, adjustable rate, in 2006 they have a five-year window for refinancing and they have to refinance this year 
and some of them they're underwater and unfortunately there would be some foreclosure short sale so you have the inventory which is going to be stubbornly high and the demand which is going to be good on the low end of the market not good at the high end of the market so the prices are not going to move but hopefully we're getting to the bottom and stabilizing speaking here. of the bottom and you mentioned problems in commercial real estate which we know about uh, maybe we've hit the bottom in the commercial market. I look at figures, for instance, the office market in Orange County, a vacancy rate that we're not used to seeing, which was close to 20%, but at least it's stabilizing. Yes. Quarter over quarter, the same 17.6% in the country. In Orange County, it actually went down. Yeah. Uh, rents even talked that rents per square foot, which had dropped, might even be ticking up a little bit. Yeah, I, th I think, especially if you look at the office space in Orange County and even Southern California, I think the peak vacancy rate was last year. I believe that this vacancy rate is going to go down by half a percentage, one percentage point. That's not enough to really push up the lease rates up. But right. you see, you use the right word, ticked up. Ticked up. A little ticked up. But uh, that's a that's a asking rent. Effective rent that is after concessions sure. that landlord give are, is going to stay about the same. But I agree with you that on the commercial side of the market, the office market probably is stabilizing and the lease rates are going to stay at this level and vacancy is slowly go down. Again, what's the factor that affects the vacancy rate? Job creation. So our forecast, which suggests, you know, we're going to get 23,000 jobs in Orange County, about 170,000 in California, is going to help because most of these jobs are in services right. sector. And what else, what else would help landlords is nobody's building a, a tower right now with, with good that, reason. That would help, sure, sure. Um, Governor Brown's out with his uh, plan, a lot of austerity, some revenue increases, as he would put it, and we'll get to that in our uh, next show. Also, one of the bright spots in the overall economy, surprise, manufacturing. Boss yes. will explain why we thought we were in a manufacturing economy anymore. Well, to some extent, we are. That's coming up on our next show. Straight ahead, our student feature stories. She's the sheriff, at least for four more years. Jonathan Formica sits down and chats with Orange County Sheriff Coroner Sandra Hutchins. That's straight ahead on the Chapman Report. Stay with us. And welcome back to the Chapman Report. It's time for our great student feature stories. A few years ago, not too many people in Orange County had heard of Sandra Hutchins, but from a crowd of well over 50, she was selected to be the next Orange County Sheriff and recently won her first election to be Sheriff Coroner. Jonathan Formiker sat down and talked to the Sheriff about what she's done, what she plans to do, part one of his conversation with the Sheriff. I am joined here at the Orange County Sheriff's Department headquarters by Sheriff Coroner Sandra Hutchins. Sheriff Hutchins is the 12th to hold the title of top cop, and she has been named the sheriff by the Orange County Board of Supervisors back in 2008 after former Sheriff Mike Corona resigned amid charges of corruption. She has since been elected by the citizens of Orange County and will begin her new term in January. Sheriff Hutchins, thank you so much for joining me here today. My pleasure. So Sheriff, what are your plans for 2010? Uh, in 2011? Uh, I'm sorry, 2011. <laughs> 2011. No, it's, it's hard to say 2011. Um, well, uh, we uh, have put a number of uh, systems in place, a number of changes in, in the organization, and uh, we want to continue that in the, the new year. We want to continue to improve upon the way we deliver services to Orange County. Uh, we certainly, our core mission is to keep the a crime rate very, very low, and uh, that, that is certainly something that we constantly focus on. Um, we're dealing with the budget, um, budget demands and, and budget issues like everyone else in the public and private sector. So we, um, we have a, a, a number of ideas uh, on how we're going to address that and continue to provide um, the, the service to the community that we've been doing. And I know you've had to make over, uh, what is it, $50 million of budget cuts recently to the department. How has that uh, affected everything here? We have found a number of creative ways to address that. And, and quite frankly, it's been a challenge, but it's also been an opportunity for us to do some creative things um, to look at the department and see places where we can create some efficiencies uh, and reduce the cost to taxpayers. So what types of efficiencies have you been able to Well, we reduced our uh, command staff structure, uh, and we have uh, in entered into contracts such as ICE 
the contract with Immigration and Customs Enforcement um, to use bed space that we have available in our jails um, that helps us pay for our personnel costs uh, in those areas. Uh, we're working on a U.S. Marshals contract, uh, renegotiating that for the same uh, type of idea, and this helps us uh, maintain our, our budget and maintain the personnel that we need uh, to staff our jails. We have um, established a new uh, civilian position in the jail, which when fully implemented will save $10 million a year. So um, that, that reduces our personnel costs. So again, you know, the budget causes you to really reflect on how you're doing business and look at ways where you can be better. That brings me uh, perfectly to my next point. I know earlier this year there were um, some top officials within the department that were laid off. And I know the department said this was for budgetary reasons and to come at c cut command staff. But these officials have been claiming that it was a lie and not the case. They claim the termination was, in fact, did not save any money to the department. What are your thoughts on that? They uh, were laid off uh, for budget reasons. Um, you know, instead of cutting uh, deputy sheriffs or people who deliver our core services uh, when people call for help uh, or staffing in the jail, which is critical to reducing liability and making sure that we're doing everything we need to do and, and providing for the security of the community by keeping those folks in jail and reducing the violence in the jail, um, I made a strategic decision to cut at the top which is seldom done in any organization. It was very difficult to call those folks in and tell them that they were being laid off. These are people, these are veterans of the department. They've been around for a long time. They do receive a retirement. Um, they were all eligible for retirement, um, but it, it's still difficult to tell someone that they're leaving the department when it's other than their choice. But I felt that it was the most prudent decision to make at the time. Um, as a sheriff, as the elected sheriff, I have to look at what's best for the community and how to provide for the public safety. And given our budget shortfall, um, we had to make some tough decisions. So when their lawyer says that um, you wanted them out because um, you wanted your own people in, what would be your response to that? Um, that's categorically untrue. Uh, it was a budget reason, and it was not a... Uh, easy thing to do. Our thanks to Sheriff Sandra Hutchins and Jonathan Formica for that part two. In our next show, we finish up with a better waffle. That's right. It's the newest rage here in Old Town, beyond Old Town. Good luck getting uh, your meal over at Bruxy. It's a long wait. Alex Ivany tells you why. The new and quickly growing Brooksy restaurant in Old Town Orange takes a new spin on the Belgian waffle offering a variety of sandwich recipes on crunchy waffles. I'm standing here in front of the Brooksy restaurant here in downtown Orange, where you can enjoy anything from a s'more sandwich to a Brooksy burger on none other than waffles. It's proximity to downtown Orange and the Orange Circle, and being right across the street from the campus of Chapman University makes it an ideal location for students to, to grab a snack in between studying. For more on the story, I interviewed the owner and employees of Brooksy. All right, Dean, well, I've met a lot of genius people, but I don't think I've ever met someone so genius to think of a waffle restaurant. How did you come up with this idea? Well, I appreciate the genius, but I don't know if it quite live up to that. Um, basically, what our concept was, we've had uh, been manufacturing the waffle for several years now, and we knew we had a great waffle product, and our goal was to try to take the waffle and make it an all-day uh, all offering. So that's basically we came up with something that can go breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, um, surround it with some great uh, compliments like uh, Pete's Coffee, frozen Wisconsin custard, and that's what we came up with. So how are you enjoying this sandwich? Very good. I love working here. <laughs> it's such a cool concept, and my classes are really close, so I could just like run to class after I work. I've never had a waffle burger. I've never had one. I don't know how the guy thought of it. I'm pretty sure, actually, I know how he thought of it. Uh, Orange Circle is really a, a fast, uh, um, growing, changing, um, evolving um, shopping center, and I think that uh, 
um, it's going to continue to do so. And as Chapman University grows and the circle becomes more popular, it just seemed to be a natural fit. This particular location is, you know, if I could pick anywhere, this would be it. I've heard uh, Brooksy Waffles talked about as being orgasmic. Would you agree? Um, yeah, to that de yeah, extent, I guess. Um, it's a great experience. Um, it's like... I don't know how to describe it. It's just like the first time we were like taste testing it, it was just so good. Like we couldn't like explain it. Never before have waffles been such a sensation as the lines outside of Brooksy prove that they have taken the Belgian waffle to the next level. I don't know about you, but I'm hungry. Our thanks to Alex for that report. And also, of course, before him to Jonathan Formica, his conversation with the sheriff. And as always, the boss, Dr. Essie Adibi, his terrific insights on the national and local economy. Jeff Cole, class of 2001, his crew, Jeff Cole Productions, put on the Chapman Report. Kiko Sura, Stephen Nelson, the crew. So much thanks to them. Bit of a windy day here uh, in late January. We'll see you next time on the Chapman Report. I'm Pete Whitesnake.